I'm Sophie. Welcome to Biblio Sophie. Biblio Sophie. This is a video. This is a video currently. I'll take a photo. late summer goodbye to summer reading vlog. I start up school again next week. Yeah. Uh, and it really feels like late summer. Uh, I had talked in a previous vlog at the beginning of the summer how particular and melancholy summer in New York is to me and that hit me right back when I came back, um, I guess two weeks ago. So I've been thinking a lot about that, and yesterday walking to rehearsal also really hit me. Um, so yeah, this is gonna be our dog days of summer, late summer, goodbye to summer thing. Some events recently, uh, there's been some shakeup in the apartment because uh, there's been a bit of a YouTube uh, extravaganza. Uh, ben of Benjamin Journal and his partner Ohad have been staying with me. They are truly delightful. Um, it's really fun having them around and uh, as a result of them being here I'm also meeting uh, New York uh, booktubers that I never met and they are wonderful. So... Ah! Oh my oh, god! You your bottom? I'm an underling! <laughs> I didn't under. <laughs> so is that does that work for you? I'm a I'm a I'm a switching under. Oh my god! Oh my god. <laughs> it's really hot and muggy today. Or actually, it's also cold. It's stormy. It's barometrically very tiring. I have to say. August is the month of the Sealy Challenge, uh, which is a challenge posed by the poet Nicole Seeley, uh, and it is to read a book of poems every day for the month of August, uh, or as close thereto as possible. It's meant to kind of de-dramatize uh, poetry and get more people familiar with it because it does tend to be the genre that people are afraid to get into or kind of hold um, at bay as something that's too elusive or too obtuse and it's meant to kind of get people reading more poetry. In short, I have not been doing it. I have not read much poetry this month, uh, but today's Monday in uh, the last week of August and I figured I would maybe get into it uh, nonetheless. Uh, with that in mind, Ben uh, picked up a book of poetry by a francophone author I've actually been meaning to read for a while even though I've never read her books. Uh, Ananda Devi is the author of um, Eve de ses décombres, uh, Eve Out of Her Ruins, in English, and it's a novel that I've been meaning to pick up for a very long time and just haven't. Uh, I didn't know about this collection of poetry when the knight, not consents, agrees, the, when the knight agrees to speak to me, uh, quand la nuit consent à me parler, which is translated into English by Kazim Ali. Um, but I have read most of it, I read most of it yesterday, and um, really liked it. Uh, Devi is from Mauritius and writes in French. This uh, collection is in both English and French, and I really like it when, here, ah, something's gonna fall. Either way, uh, I really like it when you have the original, well, see, told you something would fall, uh, when you have the original and the translation in books of translation. Um, I haven't read, I admit, the translation, I've just been reading the French, but it is, I'm, I'm really liking it. Uh, there's a lot of uh, kind of time and place, uh, there's a certain connection between the body and geography and kind of the natural world uh, and t 
times of the day. Uh, the body in terms of you know, like skin a lot comes up, but even entrails and um, yeah, the, the body in space, in a time and place and storytelling through words and through the body, this very visceral connection to words, to sounds. Uh, there's some really lovely, almost to me, surprising words that happen. Uh, or things that I kind of misread at first because of the context. So for instance, in the fourth poem, uh, you're definitely already pre, uh, preconditioned to be thinking about night because you know, you're only a few pages into this book that has night in the title. And uh, it starts with uh, ferme la porte, clos ton destin, close your door, or close the door, close your destiny. Uh, and it's a poem that has, uh, is talking about le noir, the dark. And there's a stanza that has ni la soirée fine. And that's uh, silk. La soie is silk and soirée is not necessarily a word that you see that often. It looks very, very similar to the word soirée, like soirée in English, evening. And so that was my first thought. I saw soirée and I misread it as soirée. So in not only is it actually really lovely to be talking about, you know, a fine silkness, uh, it, it uh, gets a secondary layer of association because of its proximity to another word that I sort of misread it as. And I do think that that is probably um, purposeful. I think uh, it is probably a choice of word that resembles other words uh, so that we can have, you know, kind of this fatter feeling of um, sound associations. Uh, yeah, I'm glad that he picked it up. Um, we had contemplated maybe doing a video together talking about it where he would read the English, I would read the French, and we would kind of uh, talk about it. But instead, we filmed a, a long and rollicking video about Rachel Kushner, because uh, both of us, I finished The Hard Crowd, her collection of essays uh, earlier this month, and he's currently reading them. And I picked up The Mayor of Leipzig um, a couple of days ago and read it. And um, because I had it around and had finished it, he was able to just read it this morning because it's very, very short. I won't get into it because we already talked about it a lot in that video uh, in great detail and in great intelligence, I must say. Day two is Passion by June Jordan. I picked this up a little while ago and I've been meaning to read it for a while. I actually appeared in a previous video where I said I would dip in and out rather than read it cover to cover, but I finally read it cover to cover last night and this morning. Uh, it's pretty perfect for uh, Nicole Seeley's project in a lot of ways because it is very much a poetry collection about the power of poetry, both personally and politically. Uh, Jordan was a poet who really wanted to make use of her voice for um, both the personal and the political, and of course, how much the personal is political when you are a black woman in America. Um, there is an introduction to this particular re-edition by Nicole Seeley herself, which I enjoyed, it's a short essay, and the opening of uh, this collection also has an essay by June Jordan um, on poetry, which I had read previously called uh, For the Sake of a People's Poetry, Walt Whitman and the Rest of Us, which is about the power of American poetry, what makes American poetry, what makes a political voice, what is the use of a um, poetic voice, a political voice, etc., etc. Um, in um, Seeley's introduction, uh, she makes a good um, summary of kind of the thesis of this collection, uh, and I liked um, her uh, summary. Uh, Jordan goes on to argue, quote, we are being punished for the moral questions that our very lives provoke, end quote. 
And Celia continues, in our mere living we, the underrepresented yet over-policed, remind the powers that be that we are still here despite their best efforts and, in so reminding, hold them to account. And I think this is a really excellent um, summary of both what Jordan is doing in this collection, which she is um, arguing in her opening essay, and what a lot of other poets um, contemporaneous to her before her and since have tried to do, and, and one of the uses of poetry, which is really to um, put forth a, a strong account of an existence, uh, which is itself a, a political stance. Um, sometimes to, to dare to exist is, of course, a political stance. I'm going to share one poem from uh, the towards the end of the collection, which I found both, you know, kind of funny and sad, uh, kind of softly vitriolic and tongue in cheek. It's called Memo. When I hear some woman say she has finally decided you can spend time with other women, I wonder what she means. Her mother? My mother? I've always despised my woman friends, even if they introduce me to a man I found attractive, I have never let them become what you could call my intimates. Why should I? Men are the ones with the money and the big way with waiters and the passkey to excitement in strange places of real danger and the power to make things happen like babies or war and all these great ideas about mass magazines from members of the weaker sex who need permission to eat potatoes or a doctor's opinion on orgasm after death or the latest word on what the female executive should do after hours wearing what. They must be morons, women, don't you think? I guess you could say I'm stuck in my ways as that cosmopolitan girl. So, yeah, I felt like to me it was like that explains the book or something. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. so. I think that, yeah. So. And like a rebirth, right? Like the entire point is that- It's like she wants to be the church. Yeah. like the sky and the sunshine. I'm wearing another onesie. I'm gonna to try to wear a onesie, a different onesie every day for this video. Bahad commented on the fact that I have a lot of them and so at this point it's really just become a, um, a trope for me and I really wanted to impress her. Speaking of Ben and Ahad, they left this afternoon and I have to reiterate how delightful they were as house guests. So this is my vouching for them. If ever they are in your area and they need housing, your excellent house guests and meeting strangers from the internet is fun and booktube is delightful like wow such cute wonderful people i'm i'm cavellin um day three of the Sealy challenge was this morning uh, soft targets by deborah landau i found this book on the street and it's copper canyon press which is a, um, an edition house that I really like. Uh, I was intrigued by it. Uh, so I picked it up a while ago and I'm glad I finally got to it. This is kind of the beauty of things like the Sealy Challenge. It also forces you to hunt through your own book stacks and kind of force you, forces you to remember what you have. I didn't adore this. This is not going to become my favorite poetry collection, but I am glad I read it. The soft targets in question are largely human bodies. It is about the vulnerability of being a human body in an unforgiving and dangerous world, a, a world full of violence and terrorism and you know political cataclysm uh, in a cyclical way because she talks about her, um, her grandmother escaping Nazi Germany, but then also neo-Nazis now, uh, the, the line between just how soft and squishy and vulnerable humans are on a physical level, but then also, of course, on a kind of emotional, mental, psychological, and uh, structural level, and then 
some of the forces that get at us. Um, there's a thematic towards the end of the book where we've seen so much soft, vulnerable things being human bodies and then everything else being the stuff that is dangerous to human bodies. So the um, inorganic stuff or non-human stuff is the hard stuff typically. Um, and then the motif of snow becomes very interesting because snow is also extremely vulnerable but very cold and also not human. Uh, so I appreciate that a lot as this kind of surprise theme that emerges. Uh, the title of the section comes from the beginning of... I should have closed that door. Why didn't I close that door? Uh, comes from the beginning of one of its poems and it is really a great series of sounds. The snow goes to the gallows of a warm grass and what survives. It just has a really good mouth feel. I'm going to share one of the poems from this section, which I found interesting. The deepest redress is a thick and fulsome snow, peaceful prevail of afternoon looking out at this bluish marvel the air. The snow realizes you a body, puts on you a hat, tombs you in its second nature with consequence of sepia, a leaking dusky blue. The snow fumbles at your borders, wants a way in. In the snow we are angelic, and it's not discouraging, in fact it is marvelous. When the snow has its arms around us and we walk the streets as if safe. You're a child, even in midlife. The snow clouds us in peppery breath and the air comes fresh. It comes and goes and comes again. It doesn't aim for durability, it accumulates for the sake of it, and doesn't want to last. The snow, I envy it. It will vanish, but it doesn't care. It's its own garden, its own cool chalky paint, kicks up an alabaster splendor, then retreats without complaint. Day four is a big one, big famous one. Uh, Time is a Mother by Ocean Vuong. This came out earlier this year. I picked it up shortly after it came out and started reading it, but I really couldn't get into it. I wasn't in the mood for poetry at that time, and I figured I would get back to it. So I uh, reread the portions that I had started, and I finally finished it. This really underscores how important it is to read things when you're in the mood for them. I'm really glad that I set it aside then and picked it up now. And it also really underscores how much reading specific kinds of things is a certain practice. Uh, even though I read a lot, I don't read that much poetry, and I have found that even just in a few days, reading a lot more poetry has made me able to process poetry um, better. And I'm enjoying it more than sometimes I do, and I'm just having an easier, more fluent, fluid, maybe both, uh, time going through uh, these short poetry collections. And then also, of course, having a challenge and, you know, quote, needing to um, finish a certain book because you've decided that you're going to do that that day helps. So, you know, that's also why we put certain structures around ourselves uh, or on ourselves. If you've read his previous collection, Night Sky with Exit Wounds, or uh, his novel On Earth for Reefy Gorgeous, you'll definitely recognize um, a lot of themes as well as his voice, um, themes around family and memory and loss. Uh, language as a component of memory making, language and um, creation and communication between people, but between your own self or a portion of yourself and part of your past as well. Uh, this definitely feels like the companion piece to On Earth, We're Briefly Gorgeous. Uh, that novel is written to his mother or a version of his mother and it's about his growing up and their relationship. And this book is um, about the, his grief at losing her. So it really delves into similar, not just themes, but also sorts of stories, sorts of allusions. I'm going to share a poem from towards the end of the book called um, Ars Poetica as the Maker. 
And God saw the light and it was good. Genesis 1-4. Because the butterfly's yellow wing, flickering in black mud, was a word stranded by its language. Because no one else was coming and I ran out of reasons. So I gathered fistfuls of ash, dark as ink, hammered them into marrow, into a skull thick enough to keep the gentle curse of dreams. Yes, I aimed for mercy, but came only close as building a cage around the heart, shutters over the eyes. Yes, I gave it hands, despite knowing that to stretch that clay slab into five blades of light, I would go too far because I too needed a place to hold me. So I dipped my fingers back into the fire, pried open the lower face until the wound widened into a throat, until every leaf shook silver with that God awful scream. And I was done and it was human. I want to return to Anand de Divi and when the night agrees to speak to me for a brief second because I read excerpts of all the other books that I've read so far so yeah let's do that. I don't have the physical copy with me anymore because Ben took it along with him and actually I think he has uh, left it with Rebecca Eats Books so the, the circle continues which is delightful. This is a really short uh, poem from the beginning of the book uh, a lot of the poems, especially in the first section, are very, very short. The French. Dehors, les ronces attendent la nourriture de leurs plaies. Nos yeux errent sanglants dans leurs noires harmonies. L'eau sur ma peau est une robe d'acide. And the English uh, translation that's in the book. Outside, the brambles wait to be fed by wounds. Our eyes wander bloody in their dark harmonies. Rain on my skin, a gown of acid. Um, and I'll give you an alternate translation that is my own. Um, just because I kind of hear and taste the French slightly differently. Um, for instance, I like to think of uh, noir, as black instead of uh, dark in this case. Le noir is, a, is the dark, for instance, so it is, of course, a very good translation, but uh, brambles, which I'm definitely stealing. I don't think I knew what Rons translated to in English, but brambles is a fantastic word, so thank you, Kazimali, for that word. Uh, but brambles are blackberry bushes, uh, so les ronces I do associate with blackberries and I like the more visual um, aspect of saying black as opposed to dark, which is a little bit more conceptual. So a few things like this uh, for Iri, um, I am going to use roam instead of wander because that also has a darker sound in my mind. So things like this. My translation goes. Outside, the brambles await the food of their wounds. Our eyes roam bloody in their black harmonies. The water on my skin is a dress of acid. hard one to describe. Uh, it's a weird object. For day five, I read Anne Carson's Knox. I'm holding up an empty box which contains this sort of peculiar object of a book. And actually the best uh, description that I can think of of what this object is is 
from the back of the book box itself. When my brother died, I made an epitaph for him in the form of a book. This is a replica of it, as close as we could get. So this is another grieving book. Uh, this is a book form elegy to her brother, which combines photos and uh, paper clippings and uh, translation snatches, her own poetry, um, dictionary uh, entries. It is, it's a big kind of collage of a book. It's very, very beautiful um, physically, and then also the contents of it are, in my opinion, very, very beautiful as well. The seed of uh, the content is partially a poem by the ancient Roman poet Catullus. And the thing to know about me is that I'm a huge Latin nerd. Uh, I spent all of my adolescent years really, really studying Latin and almost went into classics. I think if I hadn't gone into music, I probably would have gone into uh, linguistics classics. And I love Catullus. So this the seed of this project is partially a poem by Catullus, um, which is itself an elegy for that poet's brother. Uh, or kind of more properly speaking, and I bring out my Catullus, uh, for the ashes of his brother. He is addressing uh, the ashes. Um, to your silent ashes, since fortune has taken your own self away from me. Alas, my brother, so cruelly torn from me. And this is a kind of a tradition of elegiac verses um, that then Anne Carson uses as a motif in her own elegy to her own brother. Uh, that poem opens the book. It's one of the first pieces of text in the book. And then on the, ah, very difficult to hold, especially when I'm trying to hold it in place. Um, on the left side of the pages are dictionary entries of each of the words in that poem. So the translation of each and every single one of those words is on the left side of the book. And then her own kind of uh, family tale is on the right side pages and her own poetry. I'm going to share one of those poems which also uh, deals a lot with the intersection of translation and memory and um, understanding other people. Prowling the meanings of a word, prowling the history of a person, no use expecting a flood of light. Human words have no main switch, but all those little kidnaps in the dark. And then the luminous, big, shivering, discandied, unrepentant, barking web of them that hangs in your mind when you turn back to the page you were trying to translate. We've got an angle shift, I'm trying to keep uh, this video fresh. I'm gonna wrap it up. It's been a really big pleasure uh, to dip into a bunch of poetry this week, and I hope that perhaps I will have, um, what's the word, inspired you to do the same, look into the poems that you've been meaning to get to, or explore new ones, etc., etc. because I do think that it is a very, very rewarding uh, discipline. I'm going to end with mentioning a book that I got out of the library a few days ago and that I've only barely started but am quite liking. Uh, this is Outward, uh, what's the, Adrian Rich's Expanding Solitudes, it's a good subtitle, uh, by Ed Pavlik. It's a series of essays that uh, considers the entirety of um, Rich's poetic output and uh, considers the importance of the social aspect, uh, the connections between people as much as, uh, as actually, I like the blurb on it. Um, 
to argue that her most profound contribution in poems is her emphasis on not only what goes on within us, but also what goes on between us. Uh, so this seems like a fitting way to end a poetry vlog, and it also reminded me of a poem by Rich that kind of deals with that and that I really like. This is from her collection, An Atlas of the Difficult World. Uh, this is the very last poem of that collection. It's called Final Notations. It will not be simple. It will not be long. It will take little time. It will take all your thought. It will take all your heart. It will take all your breath. It will be short, it will not be simple. It will touch through your ribs, it will take all your heart. It will not be long, it will occupy your thought. As a city is occupied, as a bed is occupied. It will take all your flesh, it will not be simple. You are coming into us who cannot withstand you. You are coming into us who never wanted to withstand you. You are taking parts of us into places never planned. You are going far away with pieces of our lives. It will be short. It will take all your breath. It will not be simple. It will become your will. <laughs>